What's going on guys? Away Cool and Jeremiah Chan from Revolution here at Watchbox HQ in Singapore mm -hmm. on the 21st floor of Leah Towers. And we are in the presence of true greatness. We have one of the most magnificent watches ever created. And one of the rarest. And one of the rarest watches ever created before us in our hands on this trade. And it is a François Paul Jorn souscription Tobion Raymond Toit d'Egalité. And one of 20. I think this is number 18. Okay, so to understand the significance of this watch, let's go back in time a little bit. Let's okay. go to uh, 1983. Right? Okay. So at this time, uh, François Paul had created his very first Tourbillon pocket watch. Right. right. So actually, okay, leading up to that, he was working as uh, Uncle Michel's atelier, who was a master of watch restoration. Mm. And one of the clients that would frequent the premises was a man named Cecil Clutton, mm -hmm. right? An eccentric Englishman uh, of extraordinary taste. And he collected Bugattis yes, and raised them as well. And raised them and considerable wealth, obviously, mm. because he used to rock out in, with two pocket watches in either pocket of his waistcoat. Right. He had in one pocket a George Daniels pocket watch and in the other pocket a Breguet Tourbillon made in 1823. And oh, I should mention- Two of the greatest, huh? Two of the greatest and two tourbillons, right? Yes. <laughs> and this completely filled François Paul with the desire to one day have his own tourbillon. Right. But then he realized that he couldn't purchase one. His only way forward was to make his own tourbillon. It's incredible. So let's go to 1983, when he finally created his very first pocket watch tourbillon. Now, somehow along this time, he met an incredible collector named Eugene Schwinn, mm -hmm. right? And Eugene Schwinn, which um, he details his relationship with him in the video that I did with my interview with him at Brasserie Lip in Geneva, was an eccentric person, but also a man that knew watchmaking in and out. Right. right. And he went to François Paul and said, I would like you to make me a watch. Now he's uh, François Paul- but With a slightly ulterior motive, I would add. Correct, right? correct, correct. <laughs> now by, by François Paul, actually he'd asked him this several times and François Paul told him uh, previous to this, listen, I'm not even sure if I will be successful in making my watch yet with all his humility. With all his humility. So let me try to make my first tourbillon first. And if mm. I succeed, then we can embark on a, a project together. So he was successful in 1983, as I mentioned. He created his first pocket watch, tourbillon. And then he spoke to Eugene Schwinn and said, listen, I'm ready to make a, a watch for you. And Eugene Schwinn said, that's great. Uh, I would like you to make a tourbillon for me, but with... A remontoire d'égalité. A remontoire <laughs> d'égalité. So let's explain what a remontoire d'égalité is first. Well, I think we can probably just translate it to English. You know, we, we call it a constant force uh, mechanism. So it regulates the amount of energy from the mainspring in the barrel through the wheel train and then to the escapement and of course to the tourbillon. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the thing to understand is that as the torque from the barrel depletes, as power reserve goes down, less and less energy is distributed to the escapement and then therefore to the balance wheel. Mm -hmm. Now, when you put a tourbillon at the end of this wheel train, it makes it even worse. Because it's right? so heavy. Because it's, it's so and heavy. heavy. And François Paul has always said, actually, a tourbillon is like giving a boy a backpack full of stones to walk <laughs> up a staircase, right? <laughs> you know, and he said that the only way to make a tourbillon better in a wristwatch was to remove it from the influence of the power in the barrel, right. hence the remontoire d'égalité. Incidentally, the remontoire d'égalité, or the remontoire, if they say in English, yes. right, or constant force mechanism, was uh, created by a very famous uh, man who allowed the English to find longitude at sea. John Harrison? John Harrison. <laughs> I mean, he was he was the guy that yeah. allowed the British Empire its predominance because they were finally able to find longitude at sea, right? right? Now, so the way that works is that basically you need to have a time piece that is set to a reference time at mm. the port where you're leaving. In then, this case was Greenwich, right? Greenwich, exactly. And then you would be able to find your kind of local time by looking at the position of the sun relative to the horizon. Mm. And then you compare the two and the difference would allow you to tell your exact longitude. But Correct. the problem was watches were not accurate enough. And it was Harrison with his H2 and finally in H4, which was the world's first successful marine chronometer with mm. a seven and a half second remontoire de Galité that allowed the British to conquer all the native lands that they did. Well, dominate. Don Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> but, dominate. And as a Singapore former colony, well, I don't know how we feel about that. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah, John Harrison, bravo. Yeah. So the point to all this is, okay, let's go back. And uh, Eugene Schwinn had approached François Paul and he said he wanted a tourbillon with a remontoire d'égalité, which set François Paul on this journey of discovery to create what it was this iconic complication. Right. But there was an ulterior motive for this. So Jeremiah, tell us about that ulterior motive. Well, I think there was a, you know, a disagreement between Eugene and what we would consider the greatest watchmaker of the 20th century, George Daniels. Correct. And he, George Daniels had already created a pocket watch with a tourbillon and a remontoire. You know, right. and because you know there was some sort of disagreement. I think François Paul mentioned to you probably over a case of antique watches 
right? And he wanted another prolific watchmaker, which I think he identified, you know, the, that nascent talent in, in, in France 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 Hall, Hall, right? Yes. And so he wanted a watch that was equivalent yes. uh, to George Daniels. Or even Trump. Maybe, <laughs> yes. maybe, but he didn't want to. He want he, he wanted to keep it a secret. Correct. So he told François Paul not to put his name, you know, on the watch, which was a practice at, at the time. He, he told François Paul ah. that he would put his name on the dial, but he would cover it with a plate. Oh, okay. And the plate would say "Made for Doctor Eugene, Eugene Schwinn." Schwin, yeah. Right. And then he proceeded to, I guess, in today's terminology, flex. Flex. <laughs> and he would go to every watch <laughs> gathering and yeah. show it to all his friends yeah. and collectors. He would show off this incredible pocket watch with Romanto de Galite, but he showed it to everyone except, except for George, George Daniels. <laughs> and no one knew, and no one knew who the watchmaker was at the time. Right? Exactly. Okay, so let's cut from there. A few years later, another decade, we're in the 90s now, mm. right? And Francois Paul Jura makes three amazing prototypes of wristwatches with tourbillons and Romanto de Galite, which had never been done in the history of watchmaking. Correct? Yeah, I think that was in 1991. Yeah, right? so the, number, first. the first watch is, is dated 1191, mm -hmm. and the third watch is dated 1593. And I, can, I don't know what the date of the second watch is because I haven't seen a picture of it, but somewhere between yeah, 91 yeah. and 93, he made these three handmade prototypes of this incredible watch, right? And he was so frustrated because he showed this watch off at the AHCI booth, right? And it was, it's, I think it was received with what he refers to as very lukewarm reception. And no right? one got it. No one, one got it. I understood what the significance of what he accomplished. And this is the problem with sometimes being so adva in advance of everyone else, being so much of a pioneer technically and such a horological visionary that no one kind of understood the significance of what he'd achieved. Mm -hmm. But what he really wanted to do was to create this watch and series. And through creating this watch and series, he would be able to start his own brand. Yeah. So finally, he had an idea given to him by a very charming woman named Camille. Berthet. Berthet, exactly. And she proposed to him, François Paul, why don't you make this watch as a series of subscription watches? So tell us what a subscription watch is. Well, subscription, I think if it's translated to, to the English from French is subscription, right? So watchmakers in, in the past, I think maybe even from the 18th century and, and earlier, would uh, come up with a design and they would propose that to potential clients to say like, you know, I'm going to make this watch, would you like to, to, to join me in this, in this project? And I think François Paul, uh, actually the, uh, the uh, initial proposal was that uh, once the watches were created, he would give like a 50% Correct. Right, discount yes. of, of the retail price you know, to the early supporters of his work. The, amazingly, the price that he offered to this 20 people from his subscription series was 27,000 Swiss francs, which in the context of today and what François Paul Jouan watches are mm -hmm. worth and what this particular watch is worth. is a steal. It's staggering. <laughs> it's staggering. But nonetheless, he uh, very rapidly mm -hmm. got 20 clients uh, who said, okay, François Paul, let's absolutely do this. And then they gave him this 27,000 Swiss francs. And with this, he was able to start his own brand. Yeah, in 1999. Now, what's incredibly significant about these watches, all 20 of which were made between 1998 and 1999, was they were all essentially made by the man himself. Yeah. And if you look closely there are so much incredible handmade details that are the signature of the great hand of the creator. Yeah, but what I really, what I really love, um, you know, when you talk about handmade quality, is you can see, you know, these exposed screws that are uh, on the dial, you know, to screw the, the time telling sub dial too, as well as the remontoir uh, wheel. I mean, it's it's so spectacular to behold, and to think of like, you know, in this era, François Paul, you know, uh, finishing every single component mm. by himself poising the tourbillon cage, adjusting the Clement de Galité, screwing the bridge into the dial. I mean, uh, uh, setting the hand for the, uh, you know, the power reserve. power reserve mechanism. I mean, it's absolutely spectacular. You know, this watch, these 20 watches essentially created the geometric blueprint mm. for what would become one of the most important brands of all time. And if yeah. you look at it, what I really love about it is that you see from the beginning, his whole idea of balance between time indication and the display of complication. Like right. if you look at it, both the tourbillon and the dial for the hour and minute are given equal sort of importance yes. on the dial, right? Yes. One Correct. at nine o'clock and one at uh, three o'clock. And yeah. what I, I mean, think because what's happening at nine o'clock is, is regulating what's happening at three o'clock. Precisely. The and then at, at six o'clock, you have the Romain Toi Egalité that you can see functioning as you watch. Yeah. So it, it would inspire him to, to 
you know, include that uh, function in the Tourbillon uh, Souverain. Uh, exactly. Now, the, what's important to understand is that the first production series of watches was from 1999 to 2003. And already those watches have skyrocketed to extraordinary values. But this is even more rare. It's one yes. of the 20 watches that precede that and basically define everything about the brand and that makes it in Prince of Paul such a legend today. Right? Okay. So if we look at some uh, past auction results in 2020 at uh, Philips, I think they are Geneva Watch Auction uh, 11, uh, one of these subscription models, I believe it was number 14, uh, it sold for 1.4 million Swiss francs. And just a year later in 2021, uh, number one of the series uh, went for over 3.5 million Swiss francs. So there's just huge and incredible demand for these uh, early subscription uh, FP Jean watches. What's the list on this way? <laughs> uh, from what I understand, it's in excess of 3 million US dollars. Wow. But, you know, again, I mean, what are you going to say? It, mm. It's irreplaceable. There's only one of them. Plus, yep. it's a very interesting number. It's number 18 as well. What's interesting about that number? I, apparently, Asians <laughs> like the number eight. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, you're right. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. And it's also a very interesting number. It's number 18. So, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's um, two watches away from the end of the series. And, yeah. uh, and it's an auspicious number. And it's an auspicious number here Asia. in Asia as well. But, I mean, if you look at this watch, and I, I'm now going to give myself the inordinate sort of pleasure of putting it on my wrist. It is you feel just, you've been touched by God. I, you know what? <laughs> I, I, I actually, I do. Um, it is just magnificent to behold, you know. I think it's not wrong to say that oh Francois Paul is the, you know, spiritual successor to two of the greatest to have ever done it, right? Breguet yeah. and, and George Daniels. Yes. Both inspired by them, but just the breadth of, of the horological inventions that he would later uh, produce you well, know, you throughout, know, his, throughout his 20-year career. I remember that, you know, uh, when he um, presented a... a a watch to George Daniels to you know, celebrate all of his achievements. Mm. He, he mentioned that George Daniels to him was the greatest of all time, yeah. or certainly in our era, you know, and George Daniels actually said to principal, actually, it's not me anymore. Now it's you. Yeah, you're and the best. I think that's what he said. Incredible, you know. So this watch is incred uh, incredibly enough is available for sale here at Watchbox mm -hmm. um, at Leah Towers in Singapore. I guess if you are um, as thrilled about horology as we are and you want to have a once in a lifetime experience, you could probably even make an appointment to come here. Yeah, you guys should. I mean, off camera, we have a lot of good stuff that we have, you're not able to show you today, but I saw a rainbow Daytona, you know, a centigraph from uh, FP Zone as well. I mean, yeah, there's some amazing watches here. Incredible they have uh, some true unicorns here, but this is probably the rarest of them all. Mm -hmm. And it is an honor to be in its presence. Jeremiah, thank you for joining me on this wonderful moment. Thank you, Watchbox, for having us. And thank you for allowing us to touch one of the most extraordinary timepieces in creation. Could I have said it better way? Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank Cheers. you. Bye, guys. <laughs>